Hi there, I'm Nicky Gardner from the Writing Development Centre. And I'm Ed Hillier and I work as a therapist at, at the Wellbeing Service. And today we're here to talk to you a bit about delivering an academic presentation, particularly the feelings of nervousness or anxiety that tend to come with delivering presentations. Um, and, and we know from our experience that this is something that can affect students at all levels from first year undergraduate right up to final year PhD and also beyond into professional practice. I know that I've been teaching for many years and I still get nervous before I have to give a presentation, give a class or even make a video like this. Um, so, you know, the kind of the spoiler, if you like, is that we're not going to try and tell you how to make your anxiety never occurs in your life but rather thinking about ways of um, managing that anxiety and making sure that it's not going to prevent you from delivering an effective presentation. So to do that, it's useful to start by thinking a little bit about, okay, what is anxiety and is are these experiences normal, I guess? And, and Ed, I know that's a conversation you have a lot in, in your kind of one-to-one -one practice. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, funnily enough, it, it's the question that gets asked most often, you know, what is normal? Um, and I think sometimes as therapists, we kind of fudge the question and we kind of go, oh, well, everything's normal. And well, yes, it is. But I think it's also helpful to create some sort of framework to kind of explain what we're talking about. Um, and to this end, I, I've, I've got a, a, a bit of a visual to kind of um, help us on our, help us explain it, really. Um, so, yeah, so. I think what I like to think about is um, what we mean when we're talking about about normal, um, and what what we're not talking about is um, kind of things that are very very extreme anxiety. So today we're not talking about things that are at, at, that are at the far end of this of this diagram. You can see there I put on the far left hand side. Um, something called atypical anxiety. So that's very overwhelming anxiety where people really struggle to leave the house um, uh, and that sort of thing. And that that's not what, what we're talking about. What we're talking about is anxiety where you're kind of functioning, but we want you to move you from this level of functioning to somewhere uh, that's more kind of thriving. And I've put there, I just, I've used the word normal just because that's the word that, that people talk about. And what we're saying is that a level of anxiety is normal when you're delivering pr presentations. At the far end, I put something here called aspirational normality, because I think what I found is that most people tend to think that everybody else is very, very calm and has no emotion and isn't worried about delivering a, a presentation. Um, and actually, that's a very, very rare, rare quality in people. Um, it, it exists, but it's actually quite, quite uncommon. And most people kind of fit somewhere along this spectrum here. And I guess today's presentation, today's discussion is around thinking about how you can move from functioning, where you're delivering a presentation, but you have a lot of symptoms, to where you're thriving. And I think the way I, the, the, I like to look at it is that where you're actually using the anxiety in a positive way, because anxiety can be a really good, a really positive experience if it's managed and used, used in the right way. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely agree. And I love the inverted commas around that aspirational normality, um, because in, in reality, trying to get ourselves to a state where we are absolutely affectless and we're not feeling anything um, is an unrealistic goal that's going to lead to disappointment, if that's where you want to be, and also not necessarily the most helpful thing, because a bit of that enthusiasm or a bit of that, um, bit of that energy, that adrenaline can be really useful for delivering a presentation. You mentioned the kind of symptoms or sensations that tend to come with anxiety. There are quite a few common ones, aren't there? Um, and I'm sure if you're watching this, you'll, you'll be very familiar with them. Things like pounding heart, feeling sick, sweating heavily, clammy hands, shaking hands, stammering over words, feeling tight in your chest, and a kind of sometimes a really powerful internal dialogue, which is just telling you that you, that you can't do things. Those are often the kind of amongst the most common. Yeah. Um, and particularly those ones that kind of impact you during a presentation, certainly. Yeah. And like we said, we're, we're not aiming to stop these things from happening. Many of them are physiological. We can't actually stop them from happening. But it's about building in some kind of infrastructure that makes us feel more comfortable when these things occur. So one very, very common one is feeling 
a, a dryness in the mouth. And that tends to lead to uh, feeling quite self-conscious about speaking. And then we start speaking faster and faster, start tripping over words. This is a very common experience. So, you know, one very simple bit of infrastructure that we can build into our presentations is literally having a bottle of water or in my case, a glass of water there with us. Um, it's very simple. Uh, but just having that there can, of course, have the benefit of you take a sip and then you're, you're hydrating yourself. But it can also be a very um, handy prop to really slow yourself down. If you feel that you're kind of speeding up and you're getting a bit too fast, you can take a moment. Take a pause, take a sip of water. It's a way of slowing yourself down and it doesn't feel that disruptive to the audience either. Um, and, you know, often when we do speed up, there will be parts within our presentation that we, we naturally find ourselves doing it. So if we've got a bit of practice there, we can also note, put little notes to ourselves in our general presentation notes, like, um, you know, slow down here, or we can break up words phonetically if we know that there's a certain word that we just keep tripping over. So that's just, you know, an example of a couple of little things that you could do if that's one of the sensations that you have. And Ed, I know you have some really great strategies for dealing with, with shaking hands, don't you? Yeah, I mean, Definitely, shaking hands is, is one of those things that that kind of plagues people delivering presentations. Um, and yeah, sometimes what you'll find is to be much more relaxed and, you, and your hands don't shake and you think, oh great, I've, I've cured this. And then maybe many years later, it'll come back. So to that end, um, I think a lot of the time, one of the things that, that you can think about is actually turning the shaky hands into hand gestures and you can probably see me on camera I'm beginning to use my hands because if your hands are shaking well if you're moving them no no one notices as well um sometimes it it helps to hold on to something quite solid if you're actually if you're delivering a presentation where you've got a page of notes that you're reading from if you hold a single piece of paper and your hands are shaking the paper rattles which just makes things worse. But if you've got it on top of a really thick book, that actually, that actually gives you something to kind of grasp hold of. Um, and if your hands are still shaking, they'll be absorbed by the kind of weight of the book, which means you feel much calmer, which then reduces reduce the symptoms. Yeah. And again, I think what's important is the principle here, which is that yeah. we're not trying to avoid or circumvent these things. We're just working with them and accepting mm. that this is what's going to happen. Here's how I can make myself feel more comfortable. Um, and just to circle back to that point we made before really is that in many ways the the um the adrenaline that comes with yeah. anxiety can be really useful um, one of the interesting things about anxiety is that physiologically it's quite similar to excitement you know we mm. get similar physical sensations happening there um and part of one one thing you can try is just reframing how you respond to those sensations um so there's something called minimal responses where you can, when you're feeling those sensations, you can just say to yourself, I'm feeling excited about this, mm -hmm. um, say it out loud. And that can help you kind of um, internalize that, that reframing. And it can just, maybe perhaps, it's not gonna <laughs> solve any problem, but it, it can help shift you along that spectrum that, that Ed showed us at the start of, you know, from, um, you know, being unable to function to, to thriving, where we're moving along that spectrum one step at a time, perhaps. Yeah, and certainly I think working with your symptoms is always going to be a more effective way than trying to cut them out completely. Mm -hmm. um, and adrenaline can, I mean, adrenaline can be a really powerful drug. You know, it can be really exciting to stand up and deliver a presentation and to fear, you know, and it's a cliche, but you feel the fear and then you deliver the presentation and you can feel fantastic at the end mm -hmm. of it. So it's often working with it, not against it. Yeah, and... Also, an another thing to add to that is that sometimes we, we do need to be present in the moment when we're presenting. If I know exactly what I'm going to say and then I just say it, that doesn't give me much mental space to respond to the audience. If something unexpected happens, I need to adapt and react. Again, these, these things of adrenaline can be really helpful for those kind of things. Um, so those are some ways in which we might be able to like make our responses, not just kind of minimize the discomfort, but also make them work for us. Another, another big one is um, perhaps kind of procrastination oh, yeah. in terms of visualization. Ed, I know that you're, you're a fan of talking about this kind of thing. Um, and I, again, I think, I think this is as, as a result of my own experience. We often think of procrastination as being this terrible um, 
sort of negative experience where you're not getting any work done. But actually, when you're procrastinating before d designing a presentation, often that often what your body is doing is preparing you for delivering it. And you're going through the process of thinking, actually, right, what's it going to be like? What can I say? If I say this, then this might happen. Therefore, I should say this. If I plan it this way, then I should probably do this. And what it feels like is you're just stuck. Mm. But actually, all of that time is actually quite important. Yeah, one of one of the ways that we'd like to reframe it is kind of as constructive visualization, mm. where it can feel like okay, we're getting stuck in our own thoughts, but what we're actually doing is visualizing possible things that could go wrong and the and, way that we can make that useful is when we start to build a response yeah Ed, sorry yeah. Look, I, I was, I was going to say um that there's always a kind of balance between recognizing that things can go wrong and putting plans in place to kind of mm. um limit that response but also there's always space for you to think about well what if things go really right mm -hmm. what if it flows really well what if people really respond well what if they ask lots of questions and what if it's a fabulous experience delivering it delivering the presentation and I think what I'd advocate is the space for both don't think 100% positive because I think you're going to deny some of the difficulties associated with presentations but equally if you just focus solely on the negative then you can sometimes make those things happen so if we are thinking okay I'm having some kind of negative visualizations uh one, one thing we can do is think about what concrete steps can I take to make it less likely that that's going to occur and that's where we might be thinking about how we can change our presentation practice. Because one of the things about practicing a presentation is it's not all just standing up and saying your presentation over and over again. We can actually practice in different ways. So if, for example, my negative kind of visualizations or my, my, my fears that are going around in my head are I'm not going to know how to react when I'm presenting in front of other people, we can actually build that into our presentation practice by starting off by practicing you know in front of a mirror then maybe in front of one other person who you feel comfortable and trust then maybe three then maybe five if we end up positively and just building it up slowly over time so we can tailor our practice to attend to those or to, to you know kind of combat those uh, negative visualizations um so again it's about it's about actually using that voice that mm. that's you know the, the voice that says hey everything's gonna be great and the voice that says things might not be so great. They're both actually useful voices if we make sure that this negative voice becomes, it works for us, I think. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. It, it, it's about not allowing one one voice to become over, overpowering or shouting or overtly critical or punitive. It's, yes. a, it, it's about trying to make them both uh, forces for the good, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's trial and error, yeah. I think, really. Uh, as, as we said throughout, some of these things we may be able to work on. Some of these things actually we can't do much about. Um, and I think in, in that case, it's it's good to kind of recognise that it's not the end of the world as well. There is a sense in which we tend to over kind of emphasise how important these responses are. Mm. Um, well, yeah, because I, mean, I, I, th I think that brings us quite nicely to the fact that sometimes if you do stumble over your words a bit, if you uh, if things don't flow quite so smoothly, that can actually make you quite an approachable pre presenter, you know. And when it comes to the end of, it, of your presentation, I guess this is more sort of postgraduate level, but also very much, you know, it does come into undergraduate. But you want people to ask you questions, and sometimes if you deliver a very very powerful slick presentation, it means people are a bit reluctant to ask you questions, or they're trying to trip you up. Whereas if you're quite natural and and in the moment, people feel quite confident asking you questions. Um, so I think it's important that you don't try and set un unrealistic goals. Yeah, uh, audiences tend to respond well to authenticity. Yes. And yes. Well, it, it can actually help your message get across if they, if they feel that authenticity. So we don't always need to hide all of these signs of, of nervousness or anxiety. If, if, we, if we either we can't or we don't want to, that's also an option available to us. And I think it's also worth paying attention to, at least within the context of delivering an academic presentation, the most important thing isn't actually how you're presenting yourself, it's how you're presenting the work. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that's worth mentioning is that often these anxieties kind of, they tend to kind of gravitate around how am I coming across? Mm -hmm. um, and okay, there is an element to which we are always presenting ourselves, but in terms of at least how the work will be assessed, 
that's only a small part of it. The main part is what is your content? What's your message? And are you communicating that message? And you, you can absolutely communicate a message effectively while still experiencing um, symptoms of, of anxiety.